everyone, and welcome to today's virtual field trip. Just a few reminders before we begin. Trips are live and we could experience some technical issues. If that is the case, please be patient as we resolve them. And as always, we welcome and encourage your questions. So Palm Beach County students, please ask your questions in our Google Meet chat. And everyone else, you are welcome to use Poll Everywhere. We hope you are ready to learn something new and have a little fun. Benji, go ahead and take it away. Hey everybody, my name is Benji Stute. Uh, I'm with Palm Beach County's Environmental Resources Management. Um, I am so excited today because today is somehow, and I still don't know how we're doing this, the third year in a row that we are pulling off a prescribed fire live for you guys for a field trip. Um, so what makes these field trips different? Hopefully a lot of you guys have been with us before, but if this is your first time, uh, what makes these field trips different is you can ask questions in real time uh, for us to answer. We want to be guided by your questions, okay? We don't wanna say what we think we're gonna say. We wanna go where your interest takes you. Um, so please ask questions uh, as we're going through this. Uh, but today we're gonna to learn about prescribed fire, why it's so essential here in wild Florida to put fire on the ground, why so many plants and animals depend on fire um, and how we do it safely all the science that goes behind it. Um, and then we'll learn a little bit about careers in fire ecology uh, at the end of the field trip. But you guys are gonna see fire be put on the ground. You are gonna see us right next to fire and you're gonna see how it behaves. Um, so I hope you guys are excited. Um, again, please ask questions. Um, to give you a little introduction, we are here at Pine Glades Natural Area. Pine Glades Natural Area is the second largest natural area in our natural area system. Uh, this natural area is almost 6,600 acres in size. Uh, so enormous, expansive pinelands out here. Um, and this is one of the best examples that we have in the Palm Beaches of this fire maintained pine tree dominated community. Uh, while we're talking right here at the beginning, uh, you are going to see our fire managers lighting a test fire behind us and then building fire uh, as they work towards us. And then we're gonna follow that ignition team as they light uh, the land that's right behind us. So to start with, I wanna introduce you guys to our prescribed fire manager. Come on over here. So Harper Carroll is our prescribed fire manager. Um, he has been with Palm Beach County Herm for over 20 years now. Um, Harper's got some soot on his face because he has been burning all day. Uh, he and his crew were out here burning yesterday as well. Uh, and that's because you're getting ready uh, for something that's really exciting. And this is gonna be what, the third time that we've done this? Uh, it'll be the second one here at Pine Glades, but it'll be our third helicopter burn. And so if you guys couldn't hear that, Harper said helicopter burn. Yes, that is what it sounds like. So we are actually out here. We have our suppression crews. You're gonna learn what they are a little bit later, um, monitoring the fire on the ground. But the way that we're igniting the fire is literally Harper is in a helicopter. Uh, he is looking at a map with uh, a GIS map layer. He can see where the helicopter is in real time. And then he's got one of his fire managers behind him dropping these little ping pong balls, right? And so what happens? You're, you're dropping these little ping pong balls out of a moving helicopter. They, uh, they're in a hopper and they get pushed through. And the ping pong balls, which we'll hopefully see in a little bit, um, have potassium permanganate, which is like a charcoal um, and then they get injected with glycol, which is like um, antifreeze, but it's pure glycol, so no mix of water. And then depending on the humidity, they get dropped and ignite in about 10 seconds, maybe 30 seconds. And that's how we're able to do about 1,000 acres an hour. So it's a lot more efficient, a lot more safe, and just one day. There you go. All right, so Harper, um, we got a swamp buggy, buggy coming here behind us. Uh, to get geared up for this fire, uh, and to be safe, um, I need to put a little more on because you've got a lot of gear on. So what do we need to be safe here, to be safe here on the fire line? So we got hard hats. And why are we wearing hard hats? Keep your head safe from falling things like trees and branches. Right, right. So Harper, if you couldn't hear that, he's saying uh, sometimes when you're out on the fire and uh, you're fighting a spot over something like that, um, a tree branch may fall, you know, things like that. We don't know what's going on. So we gotta have our hard hat out here. Um, shelter. So. Benji, we just had a question come in. How is the training to do 
the burns from the helicopter different from the ground? So the, the question, Harper, is how is the, the training different to do burns from the helicopter than it is uh, from the ground? And I think really it's more of a progression. You've got to build from this base of training of fire science, of weather science, to be able to participate in these burns. And then, Harper, why don't you talk about where you go from there to, to be able to be certified up in the helicopter? Well, it's exactly what Benji said. It's, it's a progression. The, the folks that we recently got trained to operate the machine, um, they've been doing fire for a while. They understand it. Um, and then the, tech, the technical part of it, you know, it's an actual machine. You're in a helicopter, so there's a lot more going into it. And then just a hand drip torch that you're doing off the side of the road. Now, we are not flying the helicopter. No, we're not flying here. The helicopter is a contractor that the county contracts with. I'm up in the front seat with them. I'm directing the fire operations, talking to the crews on the ground. Um, you know, everybody is on the edges looking in, uh, keeping the fire in the box. And then um, I'm talking to the operator in the back seat who's running the machine. And we just go and start downwind and work our way in went into the wind. And that's it. It's easy in the end. All right, so back to safety gear. What we got right here, I put this belt on, and this belt has this life-saving device here. So this is our fire shelter. And if we get into a situation, hopefully we are never in this situation, but if we get into a situation, this right in here has this shelter. And this looks like it's covered in tinfoil. So this reflects heat. And this will provide a last ditch resort and firefighters, wildland firefighters, have absolutely survived uh, being burned over by ripping this open. And it's like a tiny little tent. And you get inside it, you lay down on the ground, you put it over you, um, and it helps do the best job it can from shielding you from the heat as that fire burns over you. But hopefully we never get in that situation. Uh, and one of the reasons that we don't get into that situation is because of the briefing that Harper does on every single burn, we go over the prescription, which we're gonna look at, um, and we also go over safety. Part of that safety is, I think I got it somewhere on here, L-C-E-S. Everybody on the fire line knows L-C-E-S. And that stands for? Lookouts, communication, escape routes, and safety zones. Lookouts, communication, escape routes, and safety zones. Any wildland firefighter, whether they are on the ignition team, the suppression team, bossing the burn, they should always understand their escape routes and their safety zones. Um, so that's a, that's a huge part of being able to do this prescribed fire in a way that is safe. So before I put my gloves on, which is my last part of my protective equipment, by the way, the clothes that we're wearing, this is not a fashion statement. Um, I don't necessarily like the dingy yellow. This is a product called Nomex. Um, and so this is a material that is fire retardant. So um, it will not just go up in flames, like especially if you were wearing some of these new like synthetics, like all this dry fit stuff, you do not want to be anywhere near fire with that stuff um, because not only will it burn, but it'll also melt to your skin. So everybody out here, we all have cotton t-shirts on underneath, wool socks, uh, none of those synthetic materials. And then we're covered up with this Nomex uh, to make sure that uh, fire will not catch on these clothes. All right, so, Parker, Benji, let's talk a little bit about science. We have a question. Go ahead. The question is, what kind of education is required to do this job? Oh, I love that. I love that. All right, so I'm going to tease this, um, and then we're going to talk more about it at the end, okay? So the education is all about fire training, okay? So it's not necessarily formal education out here on the burn we have we have crew members with high school degrees that are ordering people around with master's degrees and doctorates yep. so you know what i mean <laughs> so it depends on your experience in wildland fire uh and the training that you do in those programs so that's the tease and then we're going to talk a little bit more about the different careers that you can have uh in fire ecology and fire sciences uh, when we get towards the end of the burn. Um, I love that question. All right, so I'm seeing a little bit of smoke behind us. So the guys back there are lighting up a test fire. 
uh, and they're going to be building up a black line. We're going to talk about what that is. Um, I want you guys to look at this sheet and we're not going to look at every parameter. Essentially what I want you guys to see is a whole bunch of information and a whole bunch of different data. And so this prescription includes, oh, sorry. <laughs> so this prescription includes different weather parameters for all kinds of different weather, right? And, and so explain how do we manage our natural areas? Uh, like they're divided up, right? And so how do we divide up our natural areas to, to prescribe fire on the land? Well, divide up in the management unit. So different types of uh, habitat, vegetation, but also a large enough area that we can manage with. So um, the larger the site, the bigger the units are going to be. So uh, here we might have a unit, a burn unit or a management unit of four or 500 acres. Smaller site might, might be at one acre. Um, but as a whole, the fire units um, kind of different than the management unit. We try to burn as much as we can at one time safely. I like to use uh, natural breaks, so I'll burn up against wetlands so the fire can't cross it. And then we also have these access roads, these management roads that you can see behind us, uh, that break up our natural areas into different blocks. These are for our land managers to access the site, but they also, you can see it's, it's sand behind us. Um, and so sand can act as a fire break for us, which allows us to essentially chop these natural areas up into different sections that we can then use to hold fire in a certain area, right? Um, and so for each of those areas, Harper has to write a prescription. He's, he's like a fire doctor out here on the land. Um, and so just tell us about some of the different weather parameters that you have to have a specific range for that you, like, that you prescribe, um, and then you have to wait for that weather. So like, what are some of those weather conditions? Well, some of them have to do with uh, depending on where we're located. Um, I do need uh, certain winds and wind direction because I have to keep the smoke, I have to manage my smoke, keep it out of neighborhoods and major roads, away from hospitals. So that kind of starts where when I do see we're getting into right uh, conditions, the rain stops, it's getting a little drier. The first thing I'm looking for is a, is a wet, uh, certain wind. Like here, these past couple days, We've burned with an east wind and a south wind because I was keeping everything away from Jupiter Farms. Um, then I'm also looking at the humidity. So the, the lower the humidity goes, the drier it is, the, uh, the greater the fire activity is going to be. And it might not be that easy to control. It might not be that safe. So humidity is another one. So wind, uh, humidity. The other one is with the wind, I actually need some wind. So I can't just sit, a lot of people say, well, I can't believe you're burning because it's so windy. Well, that wind helps get the fire done quicker. It also gets the smoke up and out of there. So if it's a uh, if it doesn't disperse, it's a low dispersion. That's the indice that we talk about and look at, which is all dealt on winds and big crazy algorithms and stuff that are way above my uh, brain and knowledge. Um, I need a need certain winds to get that smoke up and out. So really, winds and humidities, and obviously. We got an inch and a half of rain two weeks ago. Right. So I got to wait so long for the grasses and the vegetation to dry out. So, and we need some sunlight. Right. So um, what Harper's talking about here is, is all the different considerations, right? He's got to make sure that the fire is going to burn in the way he wants to. So he needs to understand what the water levels are doing. Um, and, and if that's conducive to putting fire on the ground, um, he's got to look at two different winds, not just winds that are on the surface, on the ground, but then he's also got to look at transport winds because you can get into a fire in a situation where, yeah, it lifts up and then moves. And then all of a sudden it drops right down on something else. So he's got to make sure that he has his smoke lift, move, and then disperse and not affect anything downwind. Um, so there's just this, this incredible calculus that has to happen for each and every one of these burn units. Um, and then essentially, so during the wet season, when we're getting all of this rain in the fall, Harper is sitting there plugging away at his desk. He's managing grant contracts. He's getting work done and he's writing and dialing in those prescriptions so that right now when the water levels drop, Ready to go. we can take advantage. So right now he's running on like zero sleep. 
Um, the whole crew is out here, you know, with crazy hours um, so that we can get this fire on the land uh, because it needs it. It needs it really to maintain the native wild Florida habitats and the wildlife that utilizes them. So Harper, I wanna go over really quick, um, just the unit that we're gonna be doing today. So you can explain um, kind of where we are, where we're gonna go, and then also uh, it'll help set up some of the different firing techniques when we actually put fire on the ground here in a few minutes. Okay. So if you guys can see this map, the red line here is the unit that Harper burned and is burning today. They started out here at nine o'clock in the morning. And during the first part of the day, they were working on this chunk right here. This dark area that you see right here, these are all wetlands. And those wetlands are full of water right now. So those are natural fire breaks. There's no way the fire is going to burn across those because, you know, these wetlands are several hundred feet across, you know, more than a football field across. So they've already burned out this section where you see all these little dots. Those are pine trees. So they burned this out. We're standing right here at point L. And what we're going to be focusing on burning for the field trip is this block right here. So Harper, what we have predicted and what we were seeing on the ground today right now is an east wind. So that means we've got our north arrow here. This is north. This is east. The wind is coming from the east and going west, yep. right? So we have wind across the landscape going this way. So where do we start our burn? Like, how do we, how do we even start the burn? Because we do something called a test fire, right? Right. And so what's the point of a test fire and where would you start that test fire? So the test fire, I'm going to go furthest downwind and I'm going to look into, see how the conditions are doing, how the fire is igniting the vegetation. And I'll decide based on those conditions at that time and what I see and kind of what it might be when the humidity drops and the temperature comes up later in the day. And then if I don't like how the fire is behaving, I can easily put it out because I'm in a safe spot. All right. So I want to I want to stop right there because this is super important for the rest of the field trip. Harper said he wants to start the test fire, test fire furthest downwind. So wind is coming this way. So the furthest downwind of this block right here that we're burning is going to be over in this area. OK, because we have this big wetland full of water. We know that if we light a fire right here, it's not going to jump over because we have all of this water here. So we, we start the test fire furthest downwind because it's going to be fighting against the wind to try to expand. And that's going to give Harper the time he needs to assess if the fire conditions are what you expect, right? That's what you were talking about. With and it keeps us safe. Right. I mean, and safety is number one. Um, if, if I don't like it, it's, it's, if I shut this off, it's going into the wetland. So I, I have a good anchor point, good baseline. Right. And so that, that test fire is something that's really manageable. It starts with a little spot. You know, we might light up this little pine tree right behind me in this grass. And Harper's just going to monitor that for a few minutes. Hopefully you guys can start seeing the, the flames and the smoke uh, coming behind us. Benji, we do have a bunch of questions that are rolling in when you do get a moment. Okay, awesome. Yeah, let's, let's go with those because once this fire hits, it's going to be uh, fast and furious action. So yeah, let's, let's run through some questions. And then okay. we'll, we'll get back to the firing techniques and this fire is going to catch up to us pretty quick. All right. So there is a question that came in about, has anybody ever been burned before while doing the prescribed fires? Not with, not with my crew. No, um, you know, safety, it does happen. Um, fire's dynamic, weather's dynamic, people are dynamic, um, accidents happen. Um, but prescribed fire is actually safe. If it wasn't safe, we wouldn't be doing it. Um, the, the government, our bosses and stuff, and overall, it's a safe activity. We keep each other safe. We're trained wildland firefighters, but then we're all our day job is biologists. Um, so we're not like fire rescue and high risk or anything like that. We're, we're staying out of the smoke. We stay safe. And so we keep uh, risk as minimum as we can. Now, that, that's a great question, though, because you know, what, what a lot of you guys may think about is the stuff you see on the news, and that is the wildfires that happen out west. Um, those are wildfires. They're burning out of control in conditions that uh, very likely fire managers would never put prescribed fire on the ground. OK, um, and so those western fires that are wildfires, those wildland firefighters are trying to manage, fight that fire 
and, and get it controlled and contained. Um, and that's very, very different than what we're doing on the prescribed fire side. Yeah. On the prescribed fire side, we want a nice, slow, controlled burn um, where we have great communication going on the whole time. You guys are going to see that today. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the question was, you know, has anybody ever been burned? Um, I think it may have been before you got there. It was before I got there. There was a county staff member that got burns on his on on his arms. Um, that's right. And so in that. So anytime there is any kind of injury on any fire prescribed wildfire, doesn't matter. There is um, an incident response and uh, there's a report that is done. Uh, to make sure that we learn from those incidents. The incident uh, that happened over two decades ago um, where one of the county staff members got some burns on his arms, it came from a communication breakdown. There wasn't strong communication and that person actually took an ATV, he was on an ATV and took an ATV into an area that was unsafe without communicating that intention to the fire manager. Real, real quick, just to waste time, we do go through a medical plan procedures on how we do things, calling fire rescue, uh, incident, if we got to get a helicopter in there, it's a safety plan that we go through every time we burn. Um, they've all heard a million times, but um, just kind of goes through the steps of what happens. This is the closest hospital is uh, Jupiter Medical Center. You know, all those simple things that we lay out there uh, to keep each other safe. So all of those logistics are laid out beforehand. It has all gone over during the burn briefing. There is a there is a command structure, uh, just like in the military, where there's the burn boss, right? Harper is the incident commander here. And then we go in the tree down from, from there. There's the ignition division, the folks that are lighting the fire, and there's the holding division, the folks that are monitoring that fire, make, making sure it doesn't jump any lines. Um, and if there are any kind of spot overs, then they can extinguish those. A spot over is when you may get an ember that goes across your your uh, management road or your fire line. Um, and that does happen on prescribed fire, but that is why we have a holding division because they're constantly monitoring that fire line. They're following ignition. You're gonna see that in a little bit. Um, all right, so the fire is continuing towards us. What other questions have we got? Yeah, I have about eight questions that they've been asking. Um, all right. The next one is, is, what was the hardest fire to stop or has there ever been one that's been out of control that's put you guys in danger? I haven't had any, I've only had one I had to shut down. Um, I didn't like the conditions. It was actually right at the beginning of COVID. So That's everybody Cypress was Creek. kind of weird. That Creek, and so, right? Yeah, you guys were trying to do a virtual field trip too, or the beginning of that. And uh, nobody, people, you know, as far as we got to deal with the, the conditions, the wind, the fire, but I also got to deal with my people. So, you know, that's one of the things we're family. Um, if they're not doing a good day, I need to know about it because that's going to affect us all. And so that day was just just got weird. So we went ahead and shut it down. Uh, probably my hardest burns are the one I did at Juno a few years ago. Um, I got goosebumps even talking about because it was it just a Goldilocks, hard to get the conditions. We got it. We pulled it off. It was only 12 acres. But... Um, you know, it was a proud moment, and so we didn't have to stop it, but that was probably a stressful one that I had in front of the public. Right, and so and so you guys know he's talking about Juno Dunes. It was stressful because that's a scrub burn, okay? So this is one on, on one of our scrub sites. It's in Juno Beach. It's literally about a quarter of a mile away from the ocean. So it is surrounded by roads and condos and homes and schools and everything else. And Harper had this one specific wind direction and condition, <laughs> and he found it. And the tricky part about doing scrub burns is we're going to see a real mellow fire okay, out here. Burn. A scrub burn is what we call a stand replacing fire. This habitat naturally will burn every one to three years. Scrub habitats that are out by the beach on the on the rolling hills that you see out there, they burn every 15 to 30 years. 10 to 20. It's, it's yeah. a high intensity. It's a stand replacing fire. So it's just going to nuke everything. Right. And so... Well, here we're going to see hopefully flame lengths that are no higher than our shoulders in the grass and maybe a palmetto head that might shoot some f flames up, you know, 10 or 15 feet. In the scrub, <laughs> you're getting flame lengths that are up 20, 20 or 30, 30 feet. feet tall. I mean, cranking fire right next to people's homes. So that's yeah. why Harper's getting that one, that one, the wind, I wasn't what was forecasted. I was supposed to have a east and I had northeast the whole day. 
but it's too late. We got it done, <laughs> successful. So what's the next question? This is more for Harper. What made you want to get into this job and have you always been interested in it since you were little? Uh, into, uh, always into nature and science and um, playing outdoors, uh, biologist, and then got into doing the restoration projects on natural area, got bitten by what we call the fire bug. And um, not only is it, you know, it's a lot of, um, you just see how, you know, how much impact we can have on taking care of mother, instead of mother nature, you know, we're helping her manage these lands um, and then just kind of growing with the program and leadership and uh, just finding enjoyment of, of, you know, taking care of the woods. All right, Heather. What else we got? Next question, they would like to know, how often do you actually need to burn a specific area? So this area that we're burning now, when would be the next time we would burn it? And they'd also like to know if other states also do prescribed fires as well. Great question. Yeah, so I mean, the, the, the fire interval, that's the, the time between burns, it, it depends on the habitat, right, Harper? Yep. And so what we're looking at now is pine flatwood. So what's this one? This is typically three years, but you know, some of it'll go, some of the stuff we burned yesterday was a one year rotation. It didn't burn as great, but it still burned. Uh, this was burned three years ago. Um, so typically naturally there's enough vegetative dead fuel that would carry fire. Um, and then what was the other question? Well, we should be, so we should be really proud. The other question was what other states oh, do prescribed yeah. fire? Southeast. And here in the Southeast, we are the prescribed fire, fire, fire capital. Yeah, Florida's the fire prescribed fire capital of the world. So we do more prescribed fire than anywhere else in the world here in Florida. Um, there are other states that are trying to implement prescribed fire. Some of the Western states are trying to implement it. Unfortunately for them, it's difficult because they have had a century of fire suppression. So they had these massive fuel buildups in these enormous sequoia and Douglas fir and redwood forests. Um, and so it's really hard to put prescribed fire down because it's so explosive because of all that fuel. They also have super low humidities. They have different terrain and elevation. So other states do it, but that could be a point of pride. Florida is the prescribed fire capital of the world. All right, Benji, they are asking about ecological benefits. They want to know about our animals that are out there and they'd like to know how this affects the soil. Oh man, wow. Okay, those are amazing questions. Um, ecological benefits. Um, so pretty much every habitat in Florida has evolved to not only survive, but to thrive with prescribed fire. And so there's all these different plant species that literally will not go to seed. They won't go flower and reproduce until they have been burned over. Um, so one thing, one of the things that we do is we come out here and burn. Um, we come out here and burn. And then a couple weeks later, literally two, three weeks later, our managers will be out here looking for listed orchid species that will pop up after fire. All these different species that need fire to reproduce and to survive. Um, in this habitat, um, this is beautifully natural. Uh, so we want this open pine stand in this herbaceous ground cover. Um, and because of fire suppression uh, over the last hundred years, as we've developed, uh, a lot of these beautiful mm -hmm. wildflower species are listed and endangered because, because they've been overgrown by this brush layer. Um, okay, mm -hmm. the soil, the really Cliff, Cliff's Notes version on the soil is, this is like nature's fertilizer. Here in Florida, we can look at this soil and what we have here is sandy soil that is very nutrient poor. Okay, there's not much nutrients here in the state of Florida in our sandy soils. And so what prescribed fire does is it burns up the fuel. It burns up this grass in the, in the palm fronds and the pine needles. And that puts carbon and different nutrients back into the soil and on the ground. And so it's like nature's little fertilizer boost uh, to the landscape. And then right after this burn, I mean, literally tomorrow, there will be sandhill cranes uh, foraging out here in this burned area, looking for insects, looking for different things. In a couple of weeks, we'll get new shoots of green. We'll get turkey and deer that will come into this area. Um, and so it is just this explosion of life that happens after we put fire on the land. That's a great, great question. Got any other questions mm -hmm. before we start getting with uh, Christian and we can talk about firing techniques? 
Uh, there was one as far as carbon emissions going into the atmosphere as far as fires. Um, if too many of them are going on, how does that play into our atmosphere? And then there was a question mm -hmm. about how people that are students can help protect our natural areas. How, pe how people are what? People and students can protect our natural areas. Ah, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So really, really quick. Carbon. The important thing to remember about the carbon that is obviously going up into the atmosphere right now, okay? Florida is not only the prescribed fire capital of the world, mm -hmm. it's also one of the lightning capitals of the world. This landscape naturally burned. This is a natural process, it's a natural system, okay? So um, we regenerate the land here, and this is an absolutely essential thing for us to maintain our wild Florida landscapes. Uh, what can you guys do to help the natural areas and help preserve them? Um, it's the easiest thing. It's come out here. Come out here and visit them, explore them. Come out and, and find your happy place on the land. Find a landscape that speaks to you, um, whether it's a species of wildlife or a plant uh, or whatever. Um, you're going to find peace out here. We talk a lot about mental health uh, with being out in our natural areas. Uh, literally within minutes of you coming onto a natural area, your body chemistry changes, your stress hormones start reducing. So. Go out to the natural areas, explore them, explore wild Florida, and please go grab your neighbor or your friend who's never been and bring them out and show them what wild Florida really is. Because one of the biggest things that, that we have to combat is folks that move here that have no idea what wild Florida is. A thousand people move to Florida every single day, okay? And it's not their fault they, they don't understand what Florida is. Florida is not about Mickey Mouse and golf courses. It is about this right behind us. Um, and so come out and explore these lands and bring your friends that have just moved here or have never had this experience. That is the easiest way that you can help protect wild Florida. Um, all right, so we got some fire on the ground, guys. Um, Harper, we're gonna check in with you a little later, okay? Uh, we're gonna talk about like suppression and then fire careers and a little more on ecology, uh, but I wanna introduce you guys. This is Christian Thiebaud. So Christian is uh, the site manager here at Pine Glades Natural Area. Yep. Um, and he is also one of our certified burners. So he can actually pull permits uh, for burns. He can boss, he can be the incident commander on burns. Um, and Christian, we got, a, we got an awesome day here. We're gonna talk about some firing techniques. Um, and so I wanna pull this map out one more time because I wanna remind you guys of wind direction. And then we're gonna talk about fire behavior and what we're seeing on the ground. Kylie, can I get a time check? You have 30, you're at 32 minutes. Okay. All right, all right. We got some good time. Okay. So re remember, we are standing right here just north of L. The wind is coming this direction. So with that, sorry, we're going to talk about three different kinds of fires here. We're going to talk about a backing fire, a flanking fire, and a head fire. And then we're also going to talk about a spot fire. So a backing fire is, what you need to remember is wind directions this way. A backing fire is trying to work against the wind. So say we light up this strip right here, the backing fire would be backing this way against the wind. A flanking fire is um, parallel to the wind. So wind is coming this way. We lit off this edge right here. That's a flanking fire. So okay. what you guys watched as they were right. coming up behind Benji so and Harper was a so flanking let's back fire. Up and we'll look at this flanking fire that happened. All right, so Christian, let's come right over here. So Kylie, if you can pan over here to this road. And so now this road is that L to M, right? And so they lit fire from M to L, working this way. And so Christian, this isn't burning super, super fast because yeah. it's kind of burning sideways towards the fire, right? Yep. And nice and slow and controlled. Nice and slow and controlled, yeah. Christian's saying. Um, and so we've also got a little bit more of a southern component to the wind, right? Can we tell that a little bit? Yeah, you can see it in the smoke. And so make sure we talk the towards the mic. Yeah. So what Christian's saying is we can see the smoke and the fire leaning a little bit this way, which means we've got a little bit of a northern component. All right, so that's the flanking fire. We're gonna walk 
a little bit so we can get ahead of this fire and we'll walk into the unit a little bit. We'll put a little bit of fire on the ground um, so we can see these different techniques. Benji, while you're walking, we have a question about the fires. Does it decrease the animal's habitats? Does it decrease? Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, it increases and restores the animal's habitat. Um, and so we'll talk about uh, some of the different species that live out here and why they rely on this fire. Um, Christian, do you think we can maybe come out here and do a little strip head and look at that backing and, and head fire? So you're going to light this little area. Yeah, I think if we... So, all right, guys. So we're going to go into the unit here. Off of that palmetto a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Now, just off of it so it burns into the palmetto so then All we right. can see that go up, you know? Yeah. All right, guys, so come on over here. So, Christian right now is using a drip torch. This is called a drip torch. And so you can see, woo! Woohoo! So, he just lit that torch. And yep. And that torch is dripping a mixture of gasoline and diesel fuel. And so the gasoline burns super, super hot. The diesel fuel burns a little bit slower. Um, and essentially none of that fuel is actually hitting the soil because it's burning up before it even gets to the soil. All right, so we're gonna come right around here, Christian, so we can look down this line. And hopefully this will give you guys a great view of what we mean, the difference between a backing fire and a head fire. So Christian, um, let's face the camera so they can hear us, and then I'll point to uh, what you're talking about. All right, so on our downwind side, we're gonna have a head fire. It's going with the wind. It generally, generally burns hotter. It's more intense, less controllable. We usually don't light these until the end of the day or when we're comfortable, we have enough black around the perimeter. On your upwind side is your is your backing fire. It's backing into the wind. So in this case, it's backing towards the southeast. And it's much slower. You can see it's much less intense on this side than it is on that side. So this is cooler. It doesn't cause as much destruction, I guess you could say. And it's more natural. So what is lighting up here, guys? All right. So what we're seeing, what we're seeing right now, guys, is this explosion of flame on this saw palmetto. We're going to get you a close up of what's going on here. But saw palmetto is a perfect example of one of these plants that tells us that um, this landscape wants fire. Um, what we're going to see a little uh, more up close in a minute is this is a plant that actually, when it feels the heat of fire, it releases this volatile, meaning very flammable. Uh, oil from its fronds and you can see the fronds start to get shiny and then all of a sudden they explode into fire. So this is a plant that when it feels the heat of fire, it is actually actively trying to burn. It says, please catch me on fire. Um, one of the other things Christian is, um, I think is a good visual. So we can walk into this black here a little bit and I want to, I want to walk to where Christian lit this strip of fire. So you can see the dramatic difference. So Kylie, why don't you stay right there? All right, so what I wanna show you guys is Christian lit this strip of fire right where my foot is standing, right here, okay? So that's where he lit this strip. See how far the backing fire is gone? Not very far. Look at where the head fire is. So that head fire, is moving much, much faster than this backing fire is over here. Now, Christian, before we get out of the way and let these guys keep lighting. Yeah, Craig's going, okay, okay. Let's get, let's get out of the unit real quick and they'll keep building this fire. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them while we're moving. 
I think we're good so far. Mm -hmm. They were more concerned with the animals, but we're answering those questions in the chat. Sweet. Okay, what was our question? No they question. Do have a question about what is used to extinguish the fires. Ah, so hopefully, Christian, we don't have to do that, right? We, you want me to answer the what we use? <laughs> Yeah, so answer what we use, okay. and then and then we'll say why we don't want to use any of it. We really like to use hand tools. Mr. Harper here has a flapper, <laughs> and we use rakes. Um, I don't know how much time we have to go over them, but this kind of just takes the oxygen away. He talked about the fire triangle earlier, I'm sure. It takes the oxygen away from the fire, and it puts it out. We also have uh, brush trucks with water pumps in the back, and each truck usually has 300 gallons. And you'd be very surprised how much water, it doesn't take a whole lot of water to put out what we do. And um, at the end of the day, we use the, the trucks for mop, it's called mop up. And we have smoke sensitive areas. We like to do a good complete mop up where we actually put all the smoldering stuff out. Um, and we usually off the, when the, we put the fuels out that are still smoldering that are near the line. If they're on the inside, it's okay. But that's, that's generally what we use to extinguish fires. Um, and so what I was saying uh, uh, earlier is hopefully we don't have to use any of that. And we'll use hand tools and things like that. But we don't want to use a lot of water because we're planning this burn in a specific way. So that hopefully we're not having to use water in our hand tools to control it. Because the way that we're, we have prescribed fire on the land and the way that we're implementing the fire uh, is going to allow us to use very, very minimal water or hand tools. So you can see that there's flames burning in the background. And so Christian was talking about black. Okay. What he means by black is an area that has burned out. So Christian, when I was standing in that ring of fire, was I in any danger? No, he was in the black. He has no burnable fuels around him anymore. Um, it's all gone. There's nothing for the fire to consume, so it's out. Right, right. So remember at the beginning of the field trip, we talked about lookout, communication, escape routes, safety zones. One of our safety zones is wetlands because there's water there. The other safety zone is the black. It is area that has already burned out because we know we can go in there and we know that fire is not going to reignite in there because all the fuel has been burned out there. Um, So we got a really great head fire going behind us. Uh, Christian, you wanna, since we talked, Kylie, since we talked about um, uh, extinguishing the fire and how we put it out, um, maybe we grab some of those hand tools. So Christian's gonna switch, I'll grab the torch for you. So Christian's gonna switch from ignition to suppression. So what Christian mentioned, um, was a fire triangle. So Christian, what is the fire triangle? What are the three points of the fire triangle? Fuel, heat, oxygen. So fuel, heat, and oxygen. You need those three things for fire to happen. Once you take one of those out, either you knock out the fuel, you reduce the heat, or you kill the oxygen, that fire ceases to exist. So what are we doing here with this flapper? We're gonna take the oxygen out of the fire triangle. So Christian is gonna take the oxygen out of the fire triangle, right? And so essentially, we need a good spot to do it here. We'll do that. <laughs> and still flames. Fire's out. All right, so what he did there is there were still some little flames there, but as soon as he put that flapper over it, he cut off the oxygen supply to that fire, okay? And that fire then went out, ceased to exist. That's like, if you've ever seen somebody with a birthday candle and they pinch it to put it out, they're removing the oxygen from that fire. Or a lid on a candle. Or a lid on a candle, exactly. <laughs> um, if we were to spray water on it, Christian, what would we be doing then? We're removing the heat side out of the triangle. Right, so we'd be removing that heat from the triangle. That's how water puts, puts the fire out. Um, and then once the fire consumes all of the fuel, that fuel is gone. And that's why it cannot reignite and burn where we have black. 
All right, so Christian, let's jump ahead again of ignition because I want to look at uh, spot fire and how that happens because the spot fire is what we use when we do helicopter burns. It's just a series of little spot fires. Um, and so a lot of folks will wonder, well, if you're lighting 2,000 acres of woods on fire at the same time, doesn't that create this huge inferno? Um, and there is a huge smoke plume that you can see from far away, but when you're actually on the ground, it's amazing how uh, controlled and mellow the fire is from these helicopter burns. I'm you gotta, you gotta 15 go minutes. Okay. All right, great time to um, answer any questions you guys might have as we zoom up ahead of this fire. Um, can Benji just go over the ecological benefits one more time? We have a couple people that are still asking and proximity to the fire. How close can you guys actually get to the fire? So uh, proximity to the fire, you know, we can feel that heat. Like yeah, when that fire was behind us, we're feeling the heat. Okay. Um, and so as close as you can get, it depends on the intensity of the fire. A grass fire is not very intense. You get some of that palmetto going up and then all of a sudden that becomes more intense and you're going to have to stand farther away. Um, ecology, right? Animals. Um, it is important to, if people are worried about animals being burned up in the fire, certainly there are insects that are going to be consumed. But it's important to remember that animals, number one, are way more intelligent than we give them credit for. Number two, this is their home. They know the land they know exactly where to go to get out of danger. And so people will be really nervous about sandhill cranes that have little baby colts on the ground. But one thing to remember is these animals have evolved for tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of years in some cases to understand and survive in the presence of fire. So as soon as they smell that fire, all of a sudden they're going to their safety zones and they know where those are. They know where the wetlands are. Gopher tortoises are a wonderful example. They go straight to their burrows when they, when they smell fire and they actually have an adaptation that they can use because they're little bulldozers. And I've seen this myself on a prescribed fire at Royal Palm Beach Pines natural area where a gopher tortoise couldn't get back to its burrow and it excavates, it scratches out a little area of bare soil on the ground and then pulls itself in. And it's like its own little fire shelter. Fire burned around it and the gopher tortoise was okay. So we'll talk a little bit about why it's beneficial to the animals after we look at these spot fires. So Christian, can we go in and just put a couple of spot fires down on the ground? How far is um, yeah. Am I coming with you? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just looking for some, some good fuel. Yeah, I think maybe a couple of dots, so maybe we can see them burn together. Yeah, because then maybe you can put the palmetto thing and you can see the dogs. Okay, guys, so Christian is going to put a couple of little spot fires down on the ground. So he's reigniting his torch there. And we use these spots to create fire in a much more mellow kind of way on the landscape. So he's lit one spot right there and maybe another one right there. And then maybe can we do another one right over here and we can watch them all burn together. So we're starting all these little fires and it may be counterintuitive to think, but Christian, this firing technique is going to produce a more mellow fire than if we ran that, that strip head, right? Yeah. You come on, yeah. come on over here. So we ran that strip head earlier to show you guys the difference between a backing fire and a head fire. Now, why is this going to produce a more mellow fire on the landscape? than running that strip. Because we're not putting a ton of heat on the ground. We're letting it just spread kind of naturally, I guess you could call it. Um, you don't have a raging wildfire scene. This is gonna be much more controlled. It's not gonna kill trees. And it, it's more ecologically beneficial to this site and these natural areas than a wildfire. Right, absolutely. So. Can you guys see that also kind of in real time um, as you're looking at this? Now that we have these three little spots, remember we had that raging head fire when we did that strip head. But here, all of a sudden we've got this spot 
We've got a side that's backing right here. We've got a side that's head firing over there, but it's a little spot. And we have a spot past it that is creating black. So that when this head fire runs into that, then it's gonna be extinguished. So you see how putting little spots on the landscape is going to produce a more mellow and a more manageable uh, fire on the ground for us fire managers. And like Christian said, especially in a situation where maybe we haven't had fire on the ground for 10, 15, 20 years, the spot fires are gonna be something that our scientists are gonna implement to make sure that we don't kill off too many pine trees, right? Yes. Right, so what, what happens that makes those pine trees vulnerable when we don't have fire on the land, we get this buildup of, we get a very, it's called fuel loading, and you get a lot of fuel around these trees and they cook the roots, um, soil moisture is not right. They're just, there isn't these cooler, more beneficial fires that's more natural in the landscape. All right, so we have, we have a couple questions coming in. As far as spot fires, um, how large can they get? And then do they spread more? And then there was a question about lightning. So with us doing the prescribed fires, does that reduce chances of having out of control lightning fires? A hundred percent. Yes, that is one of the main. So there are two reasons that we do prescribed fires. Um, so to answer the other question really quickly, so a spot fire can be, you know, as small or as big as, as you allow it to be. I mean, natural lightning strike fires are one spot fire that then moves into a larger fire. We use spot fires on the landscape and lay down multiples so that they creep around and burn into each other. And that's how we can manage a more mellow fire. Um, so Christian, two main reasons why we burn. First, it, we've been talking about ecology, right? Well, ecological benefits. And then the second is wildfire mitigation. So wildfire mitigation. So that mitigation word, that's a very fancy word that just means we are lowering the risk of wildfires. When we do prescribed fires, we are taking that fuel off the land. And that way, if a lightning strike does occur, it is not going to turn into a raging wildfire because there's not going to be enough fuel to, to let that fire go. That's a great, great, great question. All right, Kristen, let's see if we can see some of these um, palm fronds get a little shiny here. You're going to see it start sweating here in a minute. It might be hard to pick up on camera. But. Yeah, it, it may be hard. So if you guys don't know what these are, these are a plant known as saw palmetto. And this is what Benji was talking about earlier, where they, they actually ask essentially to get burnt as they are a fire dependent species here in Florida that makes up a large variety of our landscapes, like our scrubs and our pine flatwoods, like where we are today. So I'm not sure if you guys can see it, but there's even some reflection of some of the flame on this frond. And that's because this frond right here is Christian called it sweating. So this frond is sweating. It's, it's releasing those volatile oils. Um, and so it's getting ready to catch on fire and to burn it. This, this plant right here absolutely wants to burn. See how big our spot fire has gotten now combined with the other one. Right, right. Exactly. All right. So, Christian, let's come back out here. Let's talk about what we did initially and the way that we're going to finish, the way we're going to finish this burn out. Seven minutes. You got seven minutes? Okay. Snake dog and burn plan. Right. Okay. So, so guys, we've been talking a lot today about building building the black let's let's let them get yeah. a good view here right <laughs> so you guys can watch some of that fire <clears throat> so we're talking about building the black so christian here's our unit right here so right now we are right up in this area here we started down here and we've been laying fire down along here now what that's creating we also went in there we put some spots in there um so fire is creeping around in here but what did we have to do first before we could light off this head fire? Because we're going to finish this out with a head fire and it's going to rip pretty quickly across the landscape. So we secured our boundary 
with black a black line here and then a black line down here and then we're slowly bumping this up so it's starting to fill in this way and it's going to run into the black and put itself out on this m to n line and we're going to finish out the day right here and this is all black we we burned this earlier today for you guys but we're not doing that right now we burned it earlier it's all black it's just going to run into this black right here it's going to stop so it's all inside the box and it will be secure here in a few minutes. So remember, we talked about earlier with Harper, this is our management road, this is our fire break, but we build that black so that that fire break goes from 15 feet wide to 300 feet wide, as wide as a football field. And that is what allows us to finish this burn the way we are, which is dragging fire up this line and creating this head fire that, that continues on. So they're gonna finish out this burn. I wanna finish our field trip with any other questions you guys have. I'm gonna talk about ecology and then we're gonna talk about, um, so think about some questions and we'll finish up with some careers. Um, so let's keep moving up. Actually, let's just stay right here. And that way, Kylie, if you get over here, then, um, then we can see the fire up close. We can see the guys putting fire on the ground. So ecology. There is all kinds of species yeah, that are actually. native and utilize this habitat species like the bobwhite quail, the sandhill crane. Um, and then there's all these beautiful, beautiful wildflowers, these listed orchid species. We'll make sure to send you some photos of these listed orchid species that depend on this fire. Um, they will not go into flower. Again, they may be laying uh, in, in these little basil leaf patterns on the ground for years and years and years waiting for that fire. And that fire, gives them the energy boost and that little fertilizer that they need to go into flower. Uh, the bobwhite quail, this is a game bird species that is hugely economically important. It was a major food source before uh, we started growing chickens all over the place. Um, and they were really widespread because of all of the fire that was on the land before we started developing and suppressing fire. In fact, much of the Appalachian range, the deep south there, uh, where you get into the oaks and everything now, a lot of that used to be pine forests until we started suppressing fire. And bobwhite quails depend on these open grass habitats because these birds almost never fly. They're running around on the ground and they're eating insects and seeds and everything else. They nest on the ground, but they require that open habitat. Their population has decreased by 80% 80, 80 over the last 100 years. And that is mostly due to habitat loss and habitat loss from fire suppression. Um, and so, like I said, you know, you come out here in July after this has been burned and we'll be serenaded every single well, day. They've been chirping all day long because we've been out here. They came back on their own as soon as we started managing this land. And it's, so it's very important. And, and the bobwhite quail is also known as the firebird. It's called yeah. the firebird because yeah. literally it cannot survive without fire on the habitat. So that's a little bit about fire ecology. Um, Christian, I want to talk about careers and we'll end with maybe one question. And we'll say hey to your teachers. Ah, uh, yes. Um, so careers, um, Christian, what's your background really quick? I'm a geoscientist background, um, former military. I got my master's degree, but um, I love fire. I got into it. I'm also a wildland firefighter. There's a few of us that took extra steps to get that certification, but uh, I've been doing this for eight years now. And um, I, I enjoy it. It's the best part of my job in uh, the land management here at Erm. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, so I, I also uh, have a degree in environmental science. But like I said, we've got a lot of folks out, out here on the burn team um, that are in our land management section. You can apply for these jobs with just a high school degree. Um, you get trained up on how to use heavy equipment. Uh, to do the management activities out here and then you get opportunities on the job for fire training and you can move up the fire ladder um, uh, and like i said we've got folks here with high school degrees that are bossing around people with advanced degrees all right we want to come over here real quick before we say bye to you guys um, some of you i hope are going to say hi to some of your rad educators and teachers hi everybody thank you for joining <laughs> thank you um, and so we love having uh, our educators out here. Um, we do training. Benji, we lost you guys. What's that? All, we, back? all we heard was training and then it cut out for a good 30 seconds.
So training with teachers. Oh, yes, we do training with teachers. Um, so get in touch with Jennifer Davis if you're a teacher and watching this uh, and uh, you haven't been out with us. Please come explore with us. Any questions, Heather, that are just got to answer before we go? No, everything has been answered. You guys did a fantastic job and the kids had a great time. All right. Thank you, guys. Explore your natural areas. Sing the praises of Prescribed Fire. It is essential to maintain Wild Florida. And we'll see you next month. We're going to do an awesome exploration. Um, we're going to give you a little surprise. You'll find out about it in about two weeks. Bye, you guys. Thank you. Bye.